Let's take our Bibles and go to Ruth chapter 1 this morning. Ruth chapter number 1 in your Bibles. The 8th book of the Bible, and we began uh, with this series last week. And so just by way of review... We remember the book of Judges. Now, the Bible doesn't go in chronological order, but we saw how the book of Judges ends in great gloom. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Then we see in 1 Samuel, there's great glory. David's united the kingdom, bringing everyone back to God. It ends in peace. How do we go from gloom to glory? And it's by way of great grace. We see in the book of Ruth. That takes place really during the time of the book of Judges. Grace is a story of new beginnings. God is always ready to offer you this morning a new beginning, a fresh start. Whatever your story, whatever your background, whatever your family, whatever your failures, whatever your past, God offers grace. A fresh start in Him. He says, come back to me and I'll help you. And so we began looking at the story of grace in the book of Ruth, and we saw how grace, and then chapter 1, we'll see how grace is exhibited. It's on display. And last week specifically, we saw that God is watching. We only looked at the first two verses. We'll get a lot more in today. God is watching. We saw that he sees the people. He sees right where you are. He knows you. What grace. You know, we... Quote John 3.16 often. Two weeks ago we preached through that on our grand reopening service. And for God so loved the world. And it's true. God loves us all. But God loves each one as well. He sees you. He's watching. He sees the people. He saw the problem. What was the problem in the land? I'll go ahead and respond if you can remember. What was the problem going on at this time in Ruth chapter 1? Anybody remember? There was a famine in the land. Yes. He saw the problem. Now, we also saw there was an expected problem. Remember the verses we read in Deuteronomy and how uh, the uh, in, God says, if you follow me, I'll bless you. If you don't follow me, you won't be blessed. Things happening in life and not going to work out. Uh, and, and there'll be a famine in the land, he even said. And we saw they did what you're right now. So it was an expected problem. What did we, can we learn from that? Blessings will not follow a life that disobeys God. Look right here this morning. We can't choose to live our own way and then claim God's blessings. God says it's not going to happen. What will happen is an expected problem, an extensive problem. It was a famine, but it was an exaggerated problem as well. They came back. If they wouldn't have left, people, uh, people there didn't leave and made it through. The Bible says there's a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end there are the ways of death. We do what we think is right and leave God's will. It doesn't end up well. But then he also finally he saw the party. Last week it was a decision. Remember the beginning? They said we're just going to go and sojourn there. Take a short trip. And then what happened? How long did they stay? Anybody remember? A decade. Ten years. They continued there. There was a decision. There was danger in it. Moab. We looked at the country of Moab. There's, there's evil there. There's enmity toward the people of God. It's a life of ease. It's, it's out of God's will. It's my own will. But there was a disaster that continued there. That was last week. We saw that God is, is watching. This morning, I'd like to encourage you from this passage of Scripture. Not only is God watching, but second of all, God is working. God is working. We're going to read some scripture and, and, and go into that. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the preaching. Lord, now as we open your word, I ask that you would cleanse me of sin, empty me of self, fill me with your spirit to rightly divide your word, give me power from on high. Lord, your spirit work in your children when we allow it to help us to set aside other things, keep our focus on what uh, you have at hand with us this morning. Work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look in Ruth chapter 1, verse number 3. The Bible says, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Yeah. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them, wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons. 
and her husband. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one there in the pew rack. I invite you to follow along with us as we go through Ruth chapter number one. By way of background uh, and, and review a little bit from last week, we have the family, Elimelech, Naomi, their two sons, Malon and Chilion. They leave Bethlehem, Judah, God's will, from Moab, their own will. While they're there, Elimelech, we saw in this verse, dies. In verses 4 and 5, their two boys, Malon and Chilion, get so comfortable living in Moab that they marry a Moabitish woman. It was not good for them to be there. It was really not good for them to marry someone there. These people were against God, and it was forbidden. They got comfortable. They married someone. In verses in verse number 5, then Malon and Chilion died. So here's Naomi. Think about Naomi. Her family has gone to Moab, left uh, Israel, left Bethlehem, Judah, and now her husband is dead and her two sons are dead. And she's left by herself. Not good. Not good to be in her situation. In verse number six, let's read it. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Naomi decides, you know what? I've been here long enough. I'm going back. By the way. This morning, wherever you find yourself in life, no matter how far you may be away from God or what small decision you may be one, it's always the right decision to return to Christ. In whatever area of your life, it's always the right decision to turn from your own will and way and to Christ. Naomi did that. In the next six verses, we will read them right now, but Naomi tries to tell her daughters-in-law, um, I don't want you coming with me. I mean, she... They weren't like blood relatives at this point. They were relatives, but it was, she couldn't have known them for long. They had only been there 10 years. The boys had to live there long enough to find them and then to marry them. So she had only known them a couple of years for, at the most. And they said, we're going to go with you. And she says, no, I don't want you coming with me. Stay here. Tries to convince them to stay. As we get to verse 14 through 18, one of them says, you know what? It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what reason you give. I'm going with you. One of them stays. One of them says, I'm going with you. And it's amazing what we can see there. Naomi's faith, Naomi's decision to go back was convincing and real enough to make someone else want to be a part of it. When you and I decide I'm going back no matter what, no matter what it may cost me, no matter how difficult it is, others are watching and they see that decision, and it can affect other people. Our lives should have that testimony. God was working in these verses in the life of Naomi to get her to come back. God was working to get her to come back. And he will work in your life this morning. He will work in my life. He will work in our lives in order for us to return to the center of his will. Can I encourage you with something this morning? There's no greater place to be than in the center of God's will. That's not just for those of us who are pastoring or in full-time Christian service. That's for every child of God. Amen. Doing exactly what God has. God, doing exactly what God wants. Living exactly the way that God uh, has declared for us. There's no greater place to be than there. Sometimes we think we're missing out on something if we give our lives over to this. And God says, no, you're missing out when you follow your own way. He's working. And the truth of the matter is, this morning, he's working in each one of your lives. To get you to a place to be right in the center of his will. What grace. I don't deserve that. When I to choose to turn and go my own way. And, and live for my, myself. I don't deserve for almighty God to work things out of my life to get me to come back. And yet he loves me so much that he does. He's working. He was working in Naomi. How is he working? I'm going to show you three ways this morning. First of all, God is working through elimination of hindrances. This one right here, through the elimination of hindrances. In verses 3 through 5, which we read just now, Elimelech dies. Tragedy. We don't know how he dies, but he dies. And what a tragedy it is that one of God's chosen people, an Israelite, dies in Moab. Bad. The truth of the matter is this morning, death is certain. The only uncertainty regarding death is when. But it will happen. 
The Bible says it's appointed on the man who wants to die. And after that, the judgment. What a tragedy it would be for a child of God to die living for himself and not living for Christ. You know, the only way we can be certain that we don't die living for ourselves is by staying in God's will. The only way we can be certain that we don't die in Moab is by staying in Israel, Bethlehem, Judah. We're not certain of when we'll die. I can share with you just instances in my immediate family. My father passed away at 41, had a heart attack. He didn't die of a heart attack. He was in the hospital for four or five days. Everything was going well. And then one early Thursday morning, it wasn't. But my sister was 19 years old when she had left God's will at 18 and lived for herself for a year and decided, you know what, I need to come back. This isn't worth it. And one day before she moved back in, murder at 19 years old. Did she think death was coming? Oh, I guarantee you no. But death is certain for all of us. The only way we can be certain that we don't die in Moab like Elimelech is by staying in Bethlehem, Judah. Staying, doing what God wants us to do with our lives. So, Elimelech dies. Malon becomes the head of the home. Malon doesn't want to leave. Malon state wants to stay there in Moab. He's been used to that. He marries Ruth, a Moabitish woman. He's got no desire to leave. Malon dies. Now Chilion's the head of the home. Chilion certainly has no intention of ever going back. I mean, he's really in it. His wife was so much in it that she never left. Then Chilion dies. One after another after another are being eliminated, so to speak. Now the decision is up to Naomi. Whether she had a part in the initial decision to leave Bethlehem, Judah, and live in Moab, we don't know. She might have been against it all along. She might have been for it. But here's what we do know in Scripture. After it all went down and the decision became hers, she returned to Israel. That says something about Naomi. Through elimination of hindrances, God showed grace to Naomi and brought her back to his will. You say, that's awful tragedy, and I agree with you. It is tragedy. That these ones died, and, but, and yet, in another way, God is working to get her to come back. He was working the difficult out for good for Naomi. I don't know each of your stories. I don't know each of your circumstances, even at this present time. I don't know what difficulties you may be going through. But can I tell you that God specializes, look right here, in taking the broken and making it beautiful. God specializes in taking the rejected and making it redeemed. God specializes in taking a vile sinner and making him clean. God specializes in taking something that seems there's no way possible this will work out and making a beautiful picture with it. The elimination of hindrances, God is working in our lives. God offers grace. But second of all, and this one's encouraging. How else was he working? He was working through information of hope. Through information of hope. Look in verse number six, if you would, please. The Bible says, then she arose, talking about Naomi, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Naomi, one day, heard some good news. You see, there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah. That's why they had left. That's the reason they give. And we're not told by what method she hears the good news. I can only speculate with that. Perhaps she's just walking uh, to town one day on the street and overhears someone saying, yeah, yeah, the Lord brought bread back to Israel. Can you imagine? She catches that. What? What did you say? There there's, there's the famine's over in Israel? Maybe she maybe she read it. I don't know if they had a newspaper of the day. Uh, uh, the Moab morning paper. I don't know. I was trying to think of a good name for it. Nothing came. Uh, maybe she was reading it. Maybe uh, she saw the life of another who had returned. Maybe there was someone else there in her situation, and she went back because she... I don't know how she heard of the good news. But whatever the case, watch this, the good news came. It is our duty. I'm going to step aside from this for just a moment. But we must always be busy spreading 
the good news to a lost and dying world. Look right here. There's a world out here that's going through a famine that needs bread. And here we have the good news of the bread of life that we must be spreading with other people. You say, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. There's no wrong way to talk about Jesus. You can talk about just what he's done in your life. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, you can't say the wrong thing. Just tell someone what he's done for you. It's our job to spread the good news. If we don't, how else are they going to hear? How else is a, a world that's lost and dying and going to hell and in famine spiritually going to hear about the good news if we don't tell them by what we say, by how we live? Though we don't know the method, what we do see here in verse number six is the message. We're told of the message that was delivered, the information of hope. I want us to look at the message. First of all, it was about a person. It says the Lord had visited his people. When I think about that, when I think about this story, I can only think about grace. Think about it for a moment. They had purposely, intentionally walked away from God. And yet here he was ready to visit with the people again. They had intentionally gone away from his blessing and from his promised land and went and did what they wanted to do when God says, I'm still back ready to forgive you. Here I am. They didn't deserve this. They deserved the mess that they were in. But he still intervened. That is grace. It's undeserved. We don't deserve God's forgiveness. You and I don't deserve, no matter how intense the sin may be, God still offers grace and forgiveness. Whatever mess you are in, God wants to intervene this morning. God wants to intervene. He's working through information of hope. We see the person, but we also see in this message the provision. Look at it again at the end of verse 6. How that the Lord had visited his people. Look at the last four words. In giving them bread. You know, it was enough the fact that he had visited his people again. Just him coming back was enough. But not only did he just come, he came with bread. Not only did he just show up, but there was a famine in the land. And now there no longer was a famine in the land. No longer was there a, 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 a lack of provision of sustenance for their daily living. What grace. Information of hope. She hears the Lord is visiting with his people. What a person. In giving them bread, what provision? And I can only think in her mind, she may be thinking now there's a, a possibility. Because of the person bringing that provision, there's a possibility. Can you put yourself in her shoes? You've been away for 10 years. And you're here. And you may wonder if, if God visited them again. If God brought bread to a land where there's famine, I just wonder if he'll do that for me. I wonder if, if I go back, if he'll bless me. I wonder if, if I return, if he'll do the same for me. The information of hope inspired her to return. I don't know what she was going through after losing her husband and her two, her two boys, but she decided after she heard this message, I'm going back. Mm -hmm. And by the way, think about that for a moment. She returns to God because she hears of the goodness of God. I am all for hard preaching on sin. I'm all for uh, making it clear what thus saith the Lord. But I'm also all for the goodness of God. The Bible says Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We're not going to win the loss by telling them how bad they are. We're going to win the loss and tell them how good God is. Amen. That's what will bring the folks back. Those, your family that you may be uh, wanting to reach back. Can I just tell you, show the goodness of God to them. Show the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God to them. That brings people back. That's what brought Naomi back. This person through which hope was given is still available to people today. This person through which hope was given is still available to people today. You and I must be busy telling others of the good news of hope. 
that they too can have. I don't know about you, but when I look around, I see a messed up world. It's sad. People mess up. And were it not for the grace of God, each of us would be in that case as well. But God chose to intervene in our lives. Who are we to keep that to ourselves? We must share the person, the provision, the possibility that God offers for their lives as well. You say, I, I just don't know how to do it. Tell them, hey, there's hope. There's hope in Christ. Can I just tell you what Jesus did for me? Can I just tell you how good he's been? I don't deserve his blessings, and yet he's helped me. Can I encourage you to share that? The provision that this person, Jesus, can bring. The possibility that others' lives can be changed. All because God's good. A picture of grace. It's on display. He's working. He's working in Naomi's life to get her to come back. He's working to get her back in the center of his will through elimination of hindrances, through information of hope. And the third of all and last of all this morning, how else is he working? Through determination of heart. Through determination of heart. See, what do you mean? God's going to use somebody, somebody's determination to encourage Naomi and to work in her life. Through determination of heart. Naomi is going back to Bethlehem, Judah in this story. But now she has a problem. What's her problem? She's got two daughters-in-law that want to go back with her. You say, why is that a problem? Can I remind you? They're from Moab. Can I remind you that's the country that's against God? That the Israelites are supposed to have no dealings with? That want it easy? So now, Naomi, it had to be hard enough. I'm just, I'm just trying to think out loud. It had to be hard enough for Naomi to return to God's will after being away for 10 years. But she's determined to do it. But now she's going to have to face this decision and take two Moabitish women with her? That had to make it twice as hard. Not only would they be her company, watch this, not only would they be the company of Naomi, but now she has to come back and they're also her relatives. I'm related to these girls. I don't know if she was ashamed necessarily of them or not, but this is always, look right here, this is always the testimony of a life lived for a time in Moab out of God's will. You may return, but oftentimes it's going to be with scars and marks that may never go away. So people may say, I wonder what it's like to just go out and test this out for a little while. Don't worry, I'll come back. The truth of the matter is, you might come back. God certainly can work it all out. But some consequences of sin for actions may remain forever. Amen. And Naomi tries to persuade her daughters-in-law, don't come back. Don't come with me. I'm going back, but you just stay here. And she uses three different ways to try to persuade them. She tries to persuade them, first of all, by using her relatives. Look at what she says in verse 8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, go. Return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. She said, look, just go back to your family. Go back to your, your family, where you've been your whole life. You might find rest there. They all cry. You know, women get together and they get inspired and they cry. And they go, how, I don't know that, how it all works. But that's what they did here. And they're going to do it again in just a moment. And so she says, no, just stay there. Can I uh, take an aside from this again for just a moment and, and encourage you and challenge you with this? Never allow any relationship with any person. To get in the way of your walk with God. Amen. No matter what relationship, no matter what person it may be, don't allow it to get in the way of your walk with God. Can I tell you the most important relationship you and I can ever have is with Christ? And if a relationship gets in the way of me reading my Bible, praying, if a relationship gets in the way of me being faithful in church, it's a relationship that needs to change. If it's a relationship that can be ended, it needs to be ended. If it's a relationship that you're bound by covenant and by promise, it needs to be a relationship that's mended through Christ. 
I'm so grateful for my wife. I'm so grateful for her love for me. But you know what I'm grateful more than her love for me is her love for God. You see, as a husband and wife, if we just love each other, that's wonderful. But I don't know about you. Well, I do. But I'm imperfect. And so are you. Okay, I was going to try to build you up a little bit. But we're all imperfect people. We're all sinners. And so the best that any two sinners can do is still imperfect. Love is not enough to keep that together and to make it last. But if two people who love each other love the Lord first, and if our relationship goes towards him first, that brings us closer together as well. And now two imperfect people are clinging to someone who's perfect. And God says, I can do something. I'll do something but the key is seeking him first. There's nothing that's more important than a Christian's walk with God. She tries to get them to stay based on their family. It didn't work. They get all emotional. They cry. They weep. They hug. And then they both, all three, keep going. So she tries again. Verse 10. They said unto her, surely we will return with the end of thy people. So it didn't work. So now she tries something else. Verse 11. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters-in-law. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for agree with me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she tells them, now she's using, she, she was using their relatives, now she's using certain reasoning. Maybe she told them, look, we're going back to Israel, and they're not going to want anything to do with you. So if you come with me, no chance of you getting married to them. So the only chance you would have of coming with me is if I had another son. And what if I started that tonight? Are you going to wait till he gets old enough for you to marry? That's a long time. You don't have much hope going back with me. That reasoning worked for one of them. In verse 14, they left up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth played with her. So Orpah says, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I won't have a chance to get married again. I'll never have kids of my own. I think I'll just stay here. Mm. Naomi also, on the end of verse 13, I read through it quickly, but she says this. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi blames herself for all the bad that had taken place in her life. Maybe it was her fault. Maybe it wasn't. But either way, she says, you know, the Lord's hand has gone out against me. But what I see in this chapter, and we won't have time to look at all of it today. We'll look at it more next week. Is that she didn't use this time when the Lord's hand, watch this, went out against her. She didn't use that to get better. She used that to get better and to return back to God. God, your hand is against me because I've gone and done my own thing. I'm coming back to you now. I, I know your hand was against me, but I'm not, I'm not running further from you. I encourage you, don't use any present circumstances to cause you to be bitter. Don't let what you're going through that may be difficult to run further away from God. See that God is offering you his grace to return to the center of his will. The answer is not running further away. The answer is drawing closer to God. What's amazing is that she says the hand of the Lord's gone out against me. What she didn't know was that very soon the hand of the Lord was going to go out for her. Amen. The same one that went out against her is about to go out for her. The same one that went out against her is about to put her in the line of Christ. The same one that was going out against her now is offering grace to bring her back. God was working, eliminating hindrances. God was working, bringing information of hope. God was working through a determination of heart. I see here in verse 14, after she gives this reasoning to Orpah and Ruth, we see the same passage. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. They get emotional. They feel something. Orpah and Ruth feel something. But only one of them acted on it. I'd like to stay here for another 30 minutes, but I'll make it quick. Feelings are great, but they won't get us anywhere. Feelings are great, but they won't accomplish anything. 
You know what I've been guilty of? Sitting in the service. I've been, in, I've been, I've told you this, I was raised on drugs, right? I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whether I wanted to or not. I mean, I'm going. I've heard thousands of messages. I was in a Christian school all my life, praise the Lord, Kinder, uh, K-4 through 12th grade, 14 years of school. I was in Bible college for four years. I worked in a Bible college after that, hearing preaching every day. I've heard thousands of sermons. You know what I've been guilty of? Oh, that's so good. That message is so good. I'm feeling that. Oh, man, I need to do something about that. And it ending right there. You say, but, but you and Carl, you felt something there. Yeah, I did feel something. Feelings mean nothing. In regards to spiritually, we have many churches around today, many churches in this city today, many churches in this county, in this state, in this country that are working up a big atmosphere to get us to feel and experience with God and to get us encouraged and, and to feel something and leave feeling like we've met with God and then we go on our merry way the rest of the week and live however we want. Feelings make no difference in the heart of a spiritual Christian. Actions determine. We need to go from feeling something to acting upon it. Orpah felt something and went back to Moab. Ruth felt something and said, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that might have been a convincing argument, but it's not enough. You and I can feel a love for God's word. I believe if, if we were to ask or raise our hands, how many of you uh, love God's word? We all raise our hand. If I was to ask how many of you uh, love uh, other people and want to see them say, good. We all can feel that, but until we actually do something about it, it makes no difference. I say, Pastor, that's rough. That's what's happening here in this story as well. We need to determine to act. When God works in his children, watch this, he prompts us to make a decision to act. Why do we have an invitation in our church? Because we want to give people the time and the opportunity to respond to what God has done. If God's spoken to our lives, he wants us to act, do something about it. Let's act right on right away and then live a certain way the rest of the week. I'm glad God didn't just feel his love for us. For God so loved the world so much. I'm glad the verse doesn't state that. For God so loved the world, he didn't just feel it. He acted upon it. That he gave his only begotten son. This, this emotional decision for Orpah ended up costing her greatly. I don't know how Orpah's life turned out. We don't see anything else about her in scripture. But I'm going to skip ahead to the end of the story for a moment. Go to chapter 4. I believe you know how it turns out for Ruth. And Ruth, before we read this verse, is redeemed. A kinsman redeemer. And we're going to learn about that over the next few weeks. But basically a very rich man, a very wealthy man, and a very spiritual man. One that feared God, decided, I want you. And as soon as he took her, everything became hers as well. All the land, all the property, all the wealth, all the, all the fortune, all the, the, the line of property, it all became Ruth's. But you know what he decided in Ruth chapter 4 verse 9? It says, And Boaz said unto the elders and all the people, Your witnesses this day, that I have bought, watch, all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Malon's is Ruth. Chilion's wife was Orpah. Had she come back, she would have been part of it too. You see what she missed out on? You see what Orpah missed out on by going back to her own way? The feeling didn't act upon it. She missed out. Christ has paid the debt for all. The truth of the matter is some are still going to choose to stay in Moab. So Naomi, back to chapter 1 and we'll finish. Naomi tries a third time. She's gotten rid of one. She's, uh, she's got rid of Orpah, but now she's got Ruth. She tried through her relatives. It didn't work for Ruth. She tried through different reasoning. It didn't work for Ruth. Verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back into her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. She tried relatives. She tried reasoning. Now she's tried religion. She said, Go back to your gods, the only ones you've known your whole life. By the way, that didn't work either. 
The devil will use whatever way he can to appeal to your flesh to get you to stay in Moab. I think we understand what Moab is and how it's a, a life of our own will. The devil's going to use whatever methods he can. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's the desire for more. Maybe it's the gods of wealth. The gods of power, of fame, of a career, of this. He's going to use these things to get you to stay in Moab. Can I encourage you? Don't just feel like you need to make the right decision. Act upon it. Be like Ruth. Determine. Determination of heart. I'm sticking with you. Though Naomi is trying her hardest to get rid of Ruth, thinking that she doesn't want her, Ruth turns out to be the greatest source of blessing ever for Naomi. God was working all this out for Naomi. A clear picture of grace. He wants to do the same for you. Maybe working things that, that you don't see how it's going to work out and you don't think are good for you. Instead, need to just turn and say, God, you're offering me grace. I don't get it all. I don't understand it all. But I'm just going to do what we sung about this morning. I'm just going to trust you. And looking at the words of Ruth in verse 16, it's amazing. Watch what she says. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And I'm amazed at this last phrase. And thy God, my God. What did Ruth know about the God of Israel? She had grown up and lived in Moab her whole life. How did she know about this God? The only way I can conclude from that is from what she's seen in Naomi's relationship with God. That's the only thing I can conclude. Naomi's life was one of hardship, but it appears that she honored the Lord through that hardship. Only thing Ruth knows about Naomi or about God and the God of Israel and the one true God is, is how Naomi has responded to these situations. She's seen her father-in-law die. She's seen her husband die. She's seen her brother-in-law die. And she sees Naomi saying, I'm still going back. The Lord's he's shown grace. He's visited our people. He's bringing them bread. I'm going back to him. That's where I should have stayed this whole time. And Ruth is looking at that and thinking, that's what I want. That's a relationship that I want to have. I want someone who can offer me grace like that. That's what I want. You and I are always setting an example to others about our God, but especially during difficult times. Be careful how you and I respond when the trials come and when the difficulties come. And our first reaction is, let's just get out of church for a little while. Be careful. Determine to honor the Lord with your life at all times. What caused Ruth to want to go to Bethlehem? Can I tell you, it was not anything that happened in the 10 years of Moab. A compromised life, the compromised living of Naomi did not bring about a desire to God for Ruth. Think about that. Living a life of ease is not going to change anyone's heart and mind and get them to want to come back to Christ. Stepping out of God's will is not going to cause our family to return to Christ. Living a time and a testimony away from God is not going to cause co-workers to come to him. Compromised life doesn't. But as soon as Naomi determined to put her life in the hands of God and let God take care of all, of all the circumstances, Ruth took notice to determine I'm following that. And though a life of compromise will never cause others to want to live for God, a determination to put our lives in his hands will. That will cause people to want that. Well, look, look at what they're going through. And they're staying faithful. There must be something there that I'm missing. Let me check on that. Let me get in a little bit on that. Uh, they're missing out on this. Let me... Wow. Wow. That's the testimony. And when I look at that, I see the grace of God. God working in the life of Naomi when she didn't even realize it. Elimination of hindrances. Information of hope. A determination of heart. Grace on display exhibited 
in so many ways. Can I tell you this morning, God's watching and God's working in your life. See the grace that he offers. See that he's working all this for your good to get you to stay close to him. Don't run further. Draw closer. God is working. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for prayer this morning.